If we're thinking about the contemporary reality of parliamentary sovereignty, then I think we have to address the problematic issue of how the judges or the senior law lords understand the role of parliamentary sovereignty in the modern constitution. Now this is a huge theme and I'm only going to look at some elements of it. I'm going to take as my major point of reference a case called Jackson and the Attorney General. I'm not going to go into the details of this case. What I want to actually look at is the speech of one of the law lords who was involved in this case, uh, Lord Stein. I want to read you a, a paragraph from Lord Stein's argument and then ask some critical questions about how Lord Stein understands parliamentary sovereignty. Let me just stress that this is a case that's post the Human Rights Act. So one of the uh, general background concerns here is the way in which the Human Rights Act is effectively ooh, shifting or altering the checks and balances uh, of power that exist within the Constitution. Remember, though, within the context of the fact that the Human Rights Act does not limit parliamentary sovereignty. Those are the key things that we need to uh, remember in order to understand Lord Stein's argument in Jackson. So here's a quotation from Lord Stein in the case Jackson and the Attorney General. Quote, we do not in the United Kingdom have an uncontrolled constitution as the Attorney General implausibly asserts. In the European context, the fact tame decision made that clear. The settlement contained in the Scotland Act 1998 also points to a divided sovereignty. Moreover, the European Convention of Human Rights, as incorporated into our law by the Human Rights Act 1998, created a new legal order. One must not assimilate the European Convention of Human Rights with multilateral treaties of the traditional type. I'll explain these terms when I come back to this in a moment. Instead, it is a legal order in which the United Kingdom assumes obligations to protect fundamental rights, not in relation to other states, but towards all individuals within its jurisdiction. The classic account given by Dicey of the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament, pure and absolute as it was, can now be seen to be out of place in the modern United Kingdom. Nevertheless, the supremacy of Parliament is still the general principle of our constitution. It is a construct of the common law. The judges created this principle. If that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise where courts may have to qualify a principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. In exceptional circumstances, involving an attempt to abolish judicial review or the ordinary role of the courts, the appellate committee of the House of Lords, or a new Supreme Court may have to consider whether this is a constitutional fundamental which even a sovereign parliament acting at the behest of a complacent House of Commons cannot abolish. It is not necessary to explore the ramifications of this question in this opinion. No such issue arises on the present appeal. Let me make a number of points about Lord Stein's argument here. It's drawn from a case, but it's not part of the ratio of the case. So Lord Stein is not saying here judges have the power to strike down parliamentary acts or limit parliamentary sovereignty. That would be a complete misreading of what Lord Stein is saying here. Lord Stein is, if you like, speculating on the nature of sovereignty. It's not just Lord Stein. There are other uh, arguments that law lords are making which move in a similar direction. All of these points are arguable as well. I just want to examine uh, what Lord Stein, though, is saying in a little more detail. The point uh, with which he opens is that the UK does not have an uncontrolled constitution. And he draws our attention to the factor tame ruling, which is obviously a case that we know about. And we know that what he is alluding to here is the way in which EU law um, effectively limits sovereignty and also provides, I suppose, an element of control within the Constitution. He also draws our attention to the Scotland Act of 1998 and uses this phrase, a divided sovereignty. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I think what is interesting is that it points towards an argument made, certainly by Scots lawyers, uh, and a, an issue that has been, again, a matter of litigation, and that is the extent to which the Act of Union, the Act which joins together Scotland and England in 1707, 
the extent to which that lays down a fundamental law or rule um, which would be binding on Parliament. For instance, the Act of Settlement says that uh, the UK Parliament cannot abolish Scottish courts or interfere with private law rights in Scotland. Um, there's a big argument on this. No court has ruled specifically on this point. And the question actually is arguable, isn't it, as to whether the 1707 Act actually does lay down uh, fundamental rules which Parliament can't change. I mean, from one perspective, the idea would be, going back to Dicey's rules of parliamentary sovereignty, that no Parliament can bind a later Parliament. So the Parliament passing the 1707 Act of Union cannot bind a later Parliament. In other words, it's legally possible that um, a later Parliament could repeal that Act or change it, and that would therefore that later parliament would not be bound by the fundamental law of the uh, Act of Union. These are imponderables. Nobody knows what the answer to these questions are, but certainly in Lord Stein's argument, this seems to be what he calls a divided sovereignty or possibly a limitation on sovereignty. He also draws our attention to the European Convention on Human Rights. As incorporated into our law, we've used the language of domestication or of bringing rights home, that's what he's talking about here. Note that he says it creates a new legal order. He says one must not assimilate it or blur it with those uh, other multilateral treaties, in other words international treaties, because as a point of um, international law, not all international treaties create rights that can be used in, the, in domestic courts. The European Convention, since the uh, Human Rights Act of 1998, does th just this. So it's why Lord Stein is saying we can't confuse it with normal international treaties. He says this. Instead, it's a legal order in which the UK assumes obligations to protect fundamental rights, not in relation to other states, but towards individuals within its own jurisdiction. That's the important thing. Note that he's not saying that this allows um, courts to strike down Acts of Parliament. It certainly doesn't. He takes it back to Dicey. As I say, Dicey is seen as an authority of the Constitution. But look what Lord Stein is saying about Dicey. He says, the classic account given by Dicey, the doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament. Then he uses the words, pure and absolute as it was. The pure and absolute doctrine of the supremacy of Parliament, as articulated by Dicey. It's rather vague language. It's not quite clear what he means here, but perhaps he means something like the continuing nature of parliamentary sovereignty, or perhaps he's alluding to those three rules of parliamentary sovereignty that we looked at earlier on. The pure and absolute account of parliamentary so sovereignty can now be seen to be out of place in the UK, not over, out of place. Note the language here. Um, nevertheless, the supremacy of parliament is still the general principle of our constitution. It's still there. We've not got rid of it. It still is the constitution. In the absence of a written constitution, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty is the general principle of the constitution. Now, look what happens next in his argument. It's a clever move. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty is a construct of the common law. What follows is that the judges have created this principle. I'm sure you might have guessed if the judges created the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, the judges could uncreate it, the judges could change the principle and bring to an end parliamentary sovereignty. That would follow from Lord Stein's argument. He goes on to say, if that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise when the courts have to qualify a principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. Rather complex way of saying that the idea of parliamentary sovereignty is not the only way of thinking about a constitution. A doctrine like the rule of law may be equally relevant, begging the question, does the doctrine of the rule of law allow us to limit parliamentary sovereignty? That seems to underlie, that contention underlies the, the next couple of sentences. In exceptional circumstances, in an attempt to abolish judicial review or the ordinary role of the courts, now, abolishing judicial review would be abolishing the supervisory jurisdiction that the courts have over decision makers. It would arguably, arguably be a breach of the rule of law or indeed the ordinary rule, role of the courts, the role of the courts to adjudicate disputes in a fair way. If Parliament started to make inroads into the ways in which courts adjudicate disputes and or abolishes judicial review, then arguably 
Parliament is in breach of a broader principle of the rule of law, which relates to the fact that uh, the courts are there to ensure that those with power remain within the terms of their power. This is Lord Stein's alternative or different hypothesis of constitutionalism. In other words, if sovereignty is a construct of the common law, and if Parliament is behaving in this way, limiting uh, judicial review or abolishing courts, then it would perhaps be open, perhaps be open to a common law judge to limit the sovereignty of Parliament, to say that the courts, to say that Parliament cannot abolish judicial review or cannot abolish a court. But note what he then goes on to say. It is not necessary to explore the ramifications in, uh, of this question, this opinion. No such issues arise on the present appeal. In other words, he's speculating, as I said earlier on. He's not saying, look, this is what's going to happen. It's almost a warning. But what's so interesting about these words is the idea that the judges are even beginning to think, are beginning to question, are beginning to think again about the conventional idea of what parliamentary sovereignty is. And that takes us back to that problem of how to stop a tyrannical parliament or a parliament that is acting against the rule of law and using the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty as a justification for that. What arguably we have here are two clashing principles, a democratic principle, ultimately justifying parliamentary sovereignty, coming across a principle such as the rule of law, which is not necessarily based on democracy. It's based on values such as fairness, which are not necessarily majority values. They are values that are uh, valuable, irrespective of the fact that most people either agree with them or disagree with them, just like human rights. Human rights are not based on the fact that most people think they're a good idea. They're based on the fact that they are human rights. That's a different argument that I don't want to get into here. But the point is that I don't think there's any uh, argument that plays the other one off the field. What we are encountering here are tensions within the Constitution, uh, which have perhaps been occasioned by British politics and have perhaps also, uh, perhaps the Human Rights Act has acted as something of a, of a catalyst here. The last point I want to make is to go back to um, uh, a term and understanding that I advertised some uh, time ago when we were looking at um, Hart's concept of the rule of recognition. And I want to look at, uh, again, it's a, a, a passage drawn from the Jackson case, but this is not Lord uh, Stein, it's Lord Hope. And in the Jackson case, Lord Hope makes use of the idea of the rule of recognition to think about the reality of parliamentary sovereignty. So I just want to read you um, this uh, paragraph from Lord Hope and explain what's going on here. So it's uh, paragraph 126 of the judgment, quote Lord Hope. As Professor Hart in The Concept of Law indicates, the categories which the law uses to identify what in, is law in certain circumstances are too crude. There is a strong case for saying that the rule of recognition which gives way to what people are prepared to recognise as law, is itself worth calling law and for applying it accordingly. It must never be forgotten that this rule, which is underpinned by what others have referred to as a political reality, depends upon the legislature, a lawmaking body, maintaining the trust of the electorate. In a democracy, the need of the elected members to maintain this trust is a vitally important safeguard. The principle of parliamentary sovereignty, which in the absence of higher authority has been created by the common law, is built upon the assumption that parliament represents the people whom it exists to serve. So what is Lord Hope saying here? I think Lord Hope is saying something quite similar to what Lord Stein is saying. As I've said, he's using this reference to Dicey, uh, sorry, to Hart, to try and understand what the reality, the constitutional reality is. Note that he says that um, uh, the idea of parliamentary sovereignty uh, can be linked to the common law. It's an argument similar to Lord Stein in that respect. Not everybody would agree, but it's at least a one possible argument that one would make. What he says about the uh, Hart's concept of the rule of recognition is that this idea of a, a legal rule of recognition gives way to what people are prepared to recognise as law. In other words, that links up with the point that he makes in the final sentence. Um, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty, built by the common law, 
uh, sorry, created by the common law, is built upon the assumption that Parliament represents the people whom it exists to serve. Now, I think this is a similar point to, Lord, to the point that Lord Stein is making, that the principle of parliamentary sovereignty is limited by a democratic mandate, which has to be understood more broadly than simply saying that the people can vote out Parliament. It's, in Lord Hope's words, linked to the idea of the trust that the electorate holds in Parliament. And if Parliament starts to behave in a tyrannical or unaccountable fashion, starts limiting human rights, let's say for sake of argument, then there may possibly be an argument that that political reality requires the courts to do certain things. In other words, to use the common law principle that they created parliamentary sovereignty to limit parliamentary sovereignty. Let me just stress, though, that Lord Hope's argument just like Lord Stein's argument, is exploratory, experimental. It's certainly not the case that the courts are presently considering or at any point in the past have limited parliamentary sovereignty. But to stress a point I made earlier, the very fact that they are using this language, the very fact that they are questioning the conventional terms of this doctrine, I think points to tensions within the Constitution and the extent to which senior law lords are unhappy about the power of Parliament, the supreme lawmaking power of Parliament. 